Good afternoon. I hope and I believe that the morning sessions, I see some of you watching, checking your watch. Yes, it's 12 and two minutes. So technically we are already in the afternoon. Um, I would like to thank you very much for your patience. And uh, I hope and I believe that the morning sessions and yesterday's uh, uh, technical sessions have been really insightful. And I believe that this is just a continuation of the discussions that we're having. Uh, we're just taking it at a policy level as well. I would like to welcome my panelists uh, for this session. Uh, I would like to welcome uh, Dr. Ita Kanji Murangi, the Honorable Minister of Education, Training and Innovation from Namibia. Allow me to also welcome uh, Professor Joyce Ndali Chako, who is the Honorable Minister of Education, Science and Technology from Tanzania. J'aimerais aussi appeler Son Excellence uh, Tijani Idrissa Abdulkader, uh, Ministre des Enseignements du Niger. I was hoping that you could come closer to me. Comme on dit les dames d'abord. Ladies first, right? And I'm also pleased to welcome Mr. Samuel Molindwa, the Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of Education, who will be representing the minister on the panel. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for joining me on, on this panel. And again, uh, the focus has to be, of course, on, on sharing what is happening in the different countries and how to potentially create synergies, learn from uh, other experiences, and also craft a, a better way forward, a better future for TVET as we discuss about rebranding uh, TVET uh, for economic growth uh, in Africa. And I would like to start uh, with you, uh, Professor Ndalichako. Uh, I know that Tanzania has done a great, has made great strides, and especially in linking TVET with industrial growth, for example. Uh, could you share with us what have been uh, some of the key elements of the journey in TVET for the country? Okay, uh, thank you very much, moderator. Uh, with Tanzania, we consider TVT as an important area for, first of all, providing uh, human resources who are skilled to work in the industry. And for us, the linkage between the, what is being provided in the vocational training colleges and what is happening in the industry is very important. And for that matter, we have uh, established sector skills councils whereby the government works with the Tanzania Private Sector Foundation because we believe that the role of the government is to provide enabling environment and then the private sector has the duty to create a job. Now the, the responsibility of the sector, uh, sector uh, skills councils is to address the challenge of mismatch between the, what is being provided in vocational training centers and what is required in the labor market. Because sometimes there are complaints that what, uh, I mean, the, the employers have to incur costs of training people who graduate from vocational training sector. And we are happy that we are addressing that through the skill sector councils. And right now we have established six in agriculture and agribusiness, tourism and hospitality, information and communication and technology, energy transport and logistics, and the area of construction. But also, we, are, we have apprenticeship programs, especially in the area of mining, uh, manufacturing sector, agriculture, where 
our students who are taking vocational training get opportunity to go and work in the, the area. And while they are working, the instructor and also they collaborate with the industries where they work to identify shortcomings in their training. So once they go back, the training providers and the industry, they work together to identify what other areas we, uh, which should be strengthened before the, the students graduate from the, the training college. And also, we realize that in our country, we have some people who, without even going to the uh, colleges, they are very good in terms of who, maybe some of them are carpenters, or uh, they do carpentry, or they do other skills. So we have introduced what we call uh, prior learning experience. So if you can participate in construction, you are doing good job, but you don't have any certificate, there is a mechanism for, go for government to recognize such people, and they, they, they are given some short training to, to strengthen it. I mean, they are, I mean, they are what? They are skills, because sometimes when they are building, they measure maybe the thickness of who, whatever cement by using their hands. But when they go now for brush up, then they'll tell if your fingers are thicker, others are thin, then you will not get correct measurement. So things like those, but we recognize the prior learning experience, and then they get short training, they, uh, they are taught how to do better than what they are doing, and then they are certified so that they can be recognized uh, in the, 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 the labor market. And lastly, maybe what I would like to share, we have a National Economic Empowerment Committee which uh, links the technical and vocational training centers with the industries to make sure that uh, there is a connection between what is being done. So through that uh, National Economic Empowerment Council, then it's another linkage where industry and TVT meet. And last but not least, we are aware that now the world is moving into fourth industrial revolution. And as a country, Tanzania, we have started in our, our training to introduce causes that will lead or will prepare our youth for the industrial revolution. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, and I will start where you ended, on the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, and I would like uh, to ask uh, you, uh, Dr. Kanji Murangi, uh, of course, the country is, is, is really working and has had to work on the attractiveness, uh, indeed, of, of TVET, for example, uh, and also leveraging on the fourth industrial re revolution, and especially in some of the sectors that are now going into transformation, such as uh, uh, natural mineral resources, et cetera, et cetera. What has been, for you, uh, a game changer or what has facilitated uh, um, some of the shift that you ha are start that we're starting seeing in your country? Thank you so much, uh, Madam Moderator. But since this is my formal platform that I have, allow me first to really thank the government of Rwanda and Kappa for having brought us together in this very informative uh, session. Secondly, before I delve into your question, allow me also to give a small historical background with regards to our education system. Prior to our independence as a country, we had 11 separate education systems operating within our country under the apartheid regime. Now, the fundamental task of government once it came into power, uh, that was 1990, was to ensure that there is proper harmonization of all the education systems into one. Indeed, that was done and it was done and carried forward with what we call Vision 2030 and also our national development plans. But also lately, starting 2015, by what we call now Harambe Prosperity Plan, which is a plan that actually accelerates Vision 2030, that some critical areas within 2030. Now, under this MPP, uh, HPP, which is Harambe Prosperity Plan, there are six main pillars that need to be accelerated forward in our industrialization attempt. One of them is TVET. Now, 
within the education system's uh, transformation shortly after independence, we realized that the general education system is fine, it's okay, it needs to be consolidated, it needs to be strengthened from primary up to university. However, we also quickly realized that industrialization, manufacturing sector and other sectors, if they are to move, we have to strengthen our TVET arm. Uh, shortly after independence, the focus was more on the general education. But quickly, the leadership realized that TVET must be given momentum as well. And I must, saying that, I must say that this momentum has actually gained uh, force in the sense that there has been a number of things that have been done within the country. One of them was to ensure that we have what we call Namibia Training Authority which is the main driver of all our TVET institutions. They all fall under this important uh, body. And this body is also overseen by our ministry, which is the Ministry of Higher Education and Training. It is important we realize also that we need to harmonize our TVET systems because uh, with all the donor funding that came from elsewhere, you realize that one particular institution will be peddling a German model type of training, another one Finnish type of training, another one, and so on. But as a country, we realize that it is imperative that we develop a Namibian TVET system. And this is what we are busy trying to do to transform and also to expand the right TVET models across our uh, regions within the country. Another thing that we realized as we were busy transforming this is that, one, the curriculum of TVET must articulate well to other levels of education. And this is where we said that there has to be a uniform uh, quality, rather qualifications framework that speaks to the needs of Namibia from primary, secondary, TVET and colleges as well as university. It has to be a seamless transition from one level to the other. But we also know that in, the, in our country, we have two major systems. One, the general one that is more uh, professional oriented and the TVET one, which is more technically oriented. And this is the one that is actually engaged consistently and repeatedly with industry. We realize that there is no way a TVET curriculum can be done without the input of industry. There is no way curriculum or rather assessment of TVET can be done without the involvement of uh, the industry. We have committees that look specifically at uh, curric TVET curricula review where all the different stakeholders are involved. The same applies when it comes to assessment. All stakeholders are involved. But of course they are overseen by the Ministry of Higher Education, Training and Innovation. Um, one other thing that I would like to mention is that we as a country, we have realized that TVET is a vehicle that can help Namibia achieve certain strategic policy uh, you know, initiatives. One of them being rural urban migration cabbing. You see, we realize that if we can have within our regions, 14 of them, a TVET center along other colleges, we will reduce the migration of our youth from those rural centers to the main towns and main cities. And it is working for us to some extent. That's one. Uh, the, the other element is the poverty reduction. Or rather, as our president says, not poverty reduction, but poverty eradication. We are actually uh, saying that within our TVET stream, we have to interweave or integrate entrepreneurship. Our graduates from our TVET system should not be job seekers, but job creators themselves. The idea is that 50% may want to proceed to say the diploma within TVET or BTEC within uh, the science-bound university, but you are saying 50% of those who are graduating should be able to come out of their training TVET systems with a bankable proposal for business to start. And this, again, is to some extent helping us to see possible dividends from our TVET system. It is great that we are part of this important uh, uh, gathering because I believe with my team that is here, we are learning a lot and we will go back and improve our system. For now, thank you.
Thank you very much, Honorable Minister, and for highlighting, of course, the need, uh, again, to, to bring about entrepreneurship and bring about uh, the, the, the poverty eradication. Uh, J'aimerais à présent venir à vous, Excellence uh, Abdulkader. Euh, et je sais que dans, dans le cas du Niger, les questions, par exemple, de, 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 de non-scolarisation, de déscolarisation et encore de chômage, comme dans la majorité des pays euh, africains et dans la région, euh, sont euh, encore assez important. Euh, quel est, selon vous, peut-être, quels ont été pour vous les éléments euh, qui ont déclenché euh, le, la réorientation de certains des efforts euh, de l'enseignement vers l'enseignement euh, euh, technique et la formation professionnelle Merci, madame. Je voudrais d'abord euh, remercier les autorités euh, rwandaises pour nous avoir invités à cette session euh, de la CAPA. Je voudrais rappeler que le Niger n'est pas membre euh, ni du Commonwealth, encore moins donc de la CAPA. Euh, nous avons été invités et si nous sommes venus, c'est parce que euh, nous avons observé euh, que les pays euh, qui sont au sein de cette organisation comparativement aux nôtres, ont connu une certaine avancée dans le développement de la formation professionnelle et technique. Et je dois avouer que le fait de faire cette activité au Rwanda a été un élément déterminant pour notre venue ici. Parce que nous observons, bien que nous soyons loin, les progrès fantastiques que le Rwanda est en train de connaître. Donc je voudrais vraiment remercier les autorités rwandaises par rapport à cela. Ceci étant, en ce qui nous concerne, c'est qu'au Niger, nous avons euh, disons connu, euh, nous avons observé les limites de notre dispositif éducatif depuis un certain temps. Nous sommes euh, un pays qui a hérité donc d'un système euh, colonial où effectivement c'était essentiellement la valorisation de l'enseignement général. Mais qu'avons-nous observé au fil des années, c'est cette inadéquation entre les sortants de nos dispositifs et les besoins réels vraiment de l'économie. Nous avons des jeunes qui sont formés et malheureusement qui n'arrivent pas à trouver et, et du travail. Et ça, c'est déjà pour ceux qui sont dans le dispositif. Mais à côté de cela, également, il y a une autre frange qui, elle, ne bénéficie même pas, n'est dans aucun système du tout et qui est là euh, pour l'essentiel euh, des œuvres et qui reste essentiellement rural. Donc ceci a amené vraiment les autorités de notre pays à réorienter, à réfléchir profondément sur la restructuration euh, de notre système éducatif et nous avons euh, conçu et élaboré une politique sectorielle de développement de l'EFPT. Ça c'est depuis 2006. Et à la demande des communes, puisque nous sommes dans un processus de décentralisation, nous avons ouvert au niveau des différentes communes de notre pays, qui sont autour de 266, des centres de formation au métier. Ces centres de formation sont ouverts dans chacune des communes à leur demande et elles intègrent, elles ouvrent les filières en fonction des opportunités de chacune des communes, en fonction des de, euh, opportunités qu'il y a dans les différents terroirs. Il est important de rappeler euh, qu'au Niger, nous avons une économie essentiellement rurale. Euh, le secteur rural, l'agriculture, l'élevage participent à hauteur de 40% au PIB. Donc c'est quand même un élément important et la grande majorité effectivement, de notre jeunesse est essentiellement rurale. Donc il faut aller prendre cette dimension-là. Comment leur ouvrir des opportunités pour qu'ils puissent euh, s'insérer socialement Donc, à la demande de ces mairies, et nous avons euh, ouvert ce centre de formation au métier. En plus de cela, au niveau des chefs lieux de département, puisque notre euh, découpage administratif parle des communes, des départements et des régions, et au niveau des départements, euh, nous avons ouvert ce que nous appelons le centre de formation professionnelle et technique qui accueille euh, aussi euh, d'autres apprenants. Euh, ça, c'est déjà en ce qui concerne euh, les déscolarisés et les non-scolarisés. Parce que la politique du gouvernement, c'est de faire en sorte que chacun, que ce soit les, les jeunes qui soient dans le dispositif formel, mais même ceux qui n'ont pas eu la chance d'y accéder, d'avoir un métier et d'avoir une activité économique en lien, effectivement, avec les, op les opportunités de manière à, le, à les fixer dans les terroirs. 
nous avons ici, il s'agit essentiellement, donc, comme je l'ai dit, des formations en fonction des opportunités. Donc vous avez toutes les filières, c'est les communes qui décident sur la base, effectivement, euh, des curricula et des programmes qui existent dans les filières en fonction des niveaux. Euh, à côté de cela, nous avons euh, le système formel. Euh, comme je vous l'ai dit, il y avait un enseignement essentiellement général, mais ce que nous sommes en train de susciter, c'est d'ouvrir les perspectives pour les jeunes au sortir de l'enseignement primaire, d'avoir des choix entre l'enseignement général et l'enseignement technique. Et là également, nous avons ouvert des collèges d'enseignement technique, ce que nous appelons les CET, des collèges d'enseignement technique où les jeunes ont cette possibilité euh, d'aller vers un enseignement technique beaucoup plus porteur, en tout cas à notre sens, ou aller dans des filières de l'enseignement général. Nous avons également les lycées techniques que nous avons multipliés. Aujourd'hui, nous en avons à peu près un dans chacune de nos régions. Voilà un peu en termes de dispositifs ce que nous avons fait et que nous sommes en train de, de renforcer. Donc, c'est la question de faciliter l'accès aux dispositifs de formation, qu'il s'agisse des jeunes qui sont dans le dispositif formel ou ceux qui sont dans le dispositif non formel, c'est-à-dire les scolarisés et les non scolarisés. Euh, mais tout cela, évidemment, euh, est accompagné dans un, un processus d'insertion. Puisque la question n'est pas de la formation pour de la formation, il faut ouvrir, il faut les accompagner pour qu'in fine, ils puissent trouver une activité. Et, et là, euh, nous avons mis en place un dispositif euh, euh, d'insertion. Déjà au niveau du ministère, il y a une direction qui, 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 qui s'occupe euh, de l'accompagnement et, et de l'orientation même euh, des jeunes. Et justement, cet outil-là, c'est pour faire en sorte que ces jeunes soient accompagnés. À côté de ça, nous avons créé aussi ce que nous appelons euh, le Fonds d'appui à la formation et à l'apprentissage, le FAPA. C'est un fonds qui est alimenté par les entreprises à travers la taxe d'apprentissage, par des ressources euh, extérieures, notamment avec certains PTF qui alimentent justement ce fonds-là, de manière à faire en sorte que les jeunes, à la fin de leur cycle, puissent euh, bénéficier d'un accompagnement, comme je l'ai dit, en termes d'outillage, s'il s'agit des gens qui ont appris des métiers, pour qu'il y ait des outils pour ouvrir leurs propres ateliers. Parce que nous sommes convaincus que euh, c'est avec le secteur privé qu'il peut y avoir de, de, des opportunités. Et donc, euh, dans cet esprit-là également, nous avons créé un conseil national, ce que nous appelons le CENEFT, le Conseil national de l'enseignement et de la formation professionnelle et technique, qui est un cadre de dialogue entre les autorités publiques hein, et le secteur privé, de manière à ce que ceux que nous formons, ceux qui sortent de nos dispositifs, puissent répondre véritablement aux besoins, justement, euh, de l'économie. Parce que c'est cela la grande question. Donc il y a ce dialogue permanent que nous faisons avec le, le secteur privé. Et nous avons créé un observatoire de la formation et de l'enseignement. Le neuf, c'est une structure euh, qui est là et qui conduit et, régulièrement des enquêtes, hein, des évaluations pour voir au gré de, sur un certain nombre de périodes quels sont les besoins objectifs de l'économie, quelles sont les filières qui paraissent être porteuses. Quelles sont les filières où il faut un peu réorienter les formations Donc voilà un peu, en termes de dispositifs, ce que nous avons, ce que nous sommes aujourd'hui en train de, de mettre en œuvre. Et l'autre dimension sur laquelle nous, nous travaillons, c'est la question de la qualité. La question de la qualité, parce que nous pensons que la formation professionnelle et technique est un secteur particulièrement où la compétition est de rigueur. Il nous faut mettre l'accent sur la qualité. Et dès lors qu'on parle de qualité, il y a ce travail que nous faisons sur les curricula et les programmes. Il y a la question des équipements, qui doivent être des équipements qui ne répondent vraiment aux normes et aux standards internationaux. Et il y a la question de la formation des formateurs. On a beau avoir des bons curricula, on a beau avoir des équipements, si nous n'avons pas de formateurs qui soient à la hauteur, effectivement, c'est un autre défi. Et donc, nous y travaillons. Et aujourd'hui, ce que nous avons en chantier, c'est justement l'ouverture très prochaine d'un centre de formation des formateurs de manière à avoir des ressources humaines de qualité qui puissent accompagner et de manière efficace et pertinente euh, nos jeunes apprenants. Donc, euh, voilà un peu ce que nous avons euh, en termes de chantier. Et, et, 
je dois dire que tout ceci est assorti d'une politique, d'une politique que le gouvernement a élaborée, d'une vision, hein, euh, d'une stratégie et euh, d'un programme que nous tentons de mettre en œuvre. Si nous sommes ici aujourd'hui, c'est parce que nous estimons que l'Afrique doit partager. Et nous pensons qu'il y a, malgré tout, des expériences qui ont réussi ailleurs. La question telle qu'elle se pose, les défis tels qu'ils se posent à notre jeunesse, vraiment, il ne s'agit pas d'inventer la roue. Il s'agit de voir quelles sont les expériences positives qui ont réussi. Et je disais tout à l'heure, nous sommes venus au Rwanda. Le Rwanda, il faut le reconnaître, c'est un pays qui a fait un, un bond qualitatif extraordinaire en si peu de temps. Je pense qu'il est bon que nous voyons comment ils en sont, sont pris. Comment est-ce que le Rwanda est arrivé à ce résultat Comment d'autres pays comme le Kenya, comme le Ghana, comme le Nigeria ont connu des bons dans, ce, dans le domaine de la formation technique et professionnelle Et donc, euh, je pense que le débat politique aujourd'hui qui est à l'ordre du jour en Afrique, c'est la question justement que l'Afrique se regarde en face elle-même et qu'on voit qu'est-ce que nous pouvons faire ensemble, qu'est-ce que aujourd'hui nous pouvons conjuguer pour de manière pertinente vraiment s'ouvrir et vraiment et, et aller dans le sens du développement. Le défi auquel nous faisons face aujourd'hui, après le défi sécuritaire que connaissent nos pays, c'est le défi de l'emploi des jeunes. Il est clair que si nous n'arrivons pas à régler, à, à régler cette question, à, 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 à trouver, à ouvrir des opportunités à, à notre jeunesse, c'est une question existentielle pour, pour nos États. Et donc, je pense que ici, nous sommes dans un cadre tout à fait positif, effectivement, d'échange, de partage, et nous souhaitons que ces cadres s'élargissent et que nous sortions des petits regroupements. Je vous ai dit que nous ne sommes pas membres, nous, du Commonwealth. Ou de... Je pense que nous devons aller vers des visions beaucoup plus élargies, beaucoup plus ouvertes, également, et développer également la mobilité de nos jeunes et en termes de, de prestations et, et, et de recherche du travail. Voilà ce que je pourrais dire, et madame. Et je vous remercie. Merci beaucoup, Excellence. Merci beaucoup. J'aime beaucoup. L'Afrique doit partager. Je pense que c'est essentiel. Et merci d'avoir partagé euh, surtout la, la perspective très décentralisée, finalement, du, du, du système euh, que vous avez mis en place euh, au Niger. Uh, I would like to, of course, uh, uh, bring you in the conversation as well, uh, Mr. Moulindwa, as um, uh, the permanent secretary in the Ministry of Education. Uh, I would like to really ask you to share, of course, on Rwanda's experience, but with a focus on innovation, because as we have seen, uh, technical and vocational uh, training have really been uh, uh, catalyzers to spur the, the innovation that we see among the youth uh, in Rwanda. So it would be good to share that as well uh, um, as you share uh, the experience of the country. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Madame Monreta. And uh, I'm delighted to come again to be sharing uh, Rwandan experience. Now, in light of innovation, and of course, I'll also touch base on uh, rebranding TVET for youth empowerment, as the, uh, the title, I think, says. Um, well, uh, as the Honorable Minister of Tanzania mentioned, uh, that uh, they are beginning to train and of course, positioning themselves you know, uh, for the uh, fourth industrial revolution, I, I think it is pertinent for African countries to definitely think about that. Because when you talk about the fourth uh, industrial revolution, where we talk about the big data, internet of things, uh, 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 artificial intelligence, and 3D, these are new technologies which are not necessarily so much utilized in our African economies. But I think we ought not to be left behind as a country and as a continent. And we don't even have so much experience of this even in our industry because these are new technologies. And I think as uh, countries, we need to make strategic partnerships with those who are doing it. Because if we don't, then we are going to be left behind. And I think enough has been enough for Africa to be left behind. And as African countries, we need to position ourselves by making strategic partnerships with developed countries who have started you know, some initiatives in some of these very new technologies. So uh, 
I would like to share an experience which is linked to this. Just last year, 2018, I was part of the delegation, a Ronan delegation that visited South Korea. That was in March. And one of the most fascinating things, we visited a, a school, a high school called Meister High School. And this is a school that trains youngsters high school in software development, coding academy. They had software, embedded systems, and cyber security. But to our fascination, we realized that th this was their first cohort of uh, graduates. They had 45 students, and the biggest proportion of those 45 had completed high school with their own patent. You can imagine. Here in Africa, people complete PhDs without patent sometimes. But high school, around 30 plus, complete high school with a patent in ICT. And when we saw it, we said, well, I think it is also possible in Rwanda. We came back beginning April. We began planning for a coding academy in Rwanda. And I would like to announce to the distinguished members here that in January and Jan, we started a coding academy in Rwanda of this year. And we brought on board 30, 60 smart brains, 30 boys, 30 girls, the smartest in mathematics, physics, and English. Two weeks ago, we took them up country, by the way. We need, we need a minimal disruption. Minimal disruption from the things of you know the urban area. And it's simply amazing. These are young boys after ordinary level, but what they are doing in six months, we could not believe ourselves. So why did we do so? We wanted to position ourselves for innovators. When you give these youngsters an opportunity, they can make it. We saw it, what the Koreans did. We expect that in the next two years. We expect that these youngsters can do something. And in light of that, it gave us an inspiration as a country. And by the way, this is a TVET school. I want to talk about it in light of TVET. We call it TVET Nyabihu. It's under TVET Nyabihu, but this, it's a specialized coding academy of smart, brilliant young boys and men and girls, sorry, who are doing uh, software development, embedded systems, and cyber security. Now, in light of that, we thought that we need now to also establish specialized academies in Tibet who are going to be the innovators of tomorrow. This is how we are looking at it. And number two, I think Tivet, in light of rebranding Tivet, there are lots of classical and traditional modes of training. We think something needs to be done differently. Of recent, we started what we call the rapid response training. Rapid response training, when FDIs come, these foreign direct investments, when they come, Sometimes they come when we don't have those specific skills. And we say, look, we have a fund aside. You want to employ 100 or 200 or 300 Rwandans. We don't have the skills as you want it. However, we want to partner with you, give the skills you want, contextualize to your requirements that these people get the job. So we've been doing that. And for companies that come on board, we do contextualized training, and the 500, the 300, 200 trainees are already guaranteed of employment. So you finish, straight away enter the company because you've been trained for that. And it has been so successful, we've been doing it, I think, for the last five years. And of course, we cannot say that it is in this sector or this sector. It depends on a sector that has positioned itself to come. And we've set aside a revolving fund. So when those people get employed, 
they pay back because they are already guaranteed of an income and a very small proportion is got from their salary and replenish the fund so much that we are in position to keep on training others. Number three, we thought of TVET because in every country, in African countries, specific regions have specific economic potentialities. So what we did, we did mapping. We said region X, Y, Z has different economic opportunities. So how do we target, do targeted training in relation to specific economic opportunities in those areas? Because that is where jobs can be created because they have such potentials. So we did that. We mapped economic potentialities of specific regions and did contextualized short-term technical vocational training. This is what we do in East and more rarely. You do things related to that. When you go to areas where there is mining, you package a mining package. When you go to tourism, you go for hospitality. So each of these different regions, we do targeting. And in such instances, we don't restrict ourselves to only schools. We make ourselves mobile. Because you might want to do the targeting where you've not established a facility that can be fully utilized for your training. So we modify and are flexible to enable the training to happen. Of course, there are big things which you might not necessarily take. For such, you know, you bring them, but quite often other trainings are taken closer to the trainees. And by the way, in this instance, this is packaged under what we call the National Employment Program. And uh, the National Employment Program has been in existence for five years where we link skills development to entrepreneurship development and business development. We have another component linked to that, which is public works, because not all people are endowed to, do, to be business people. You can give them a package for in, uh, entrepreneurship development, business development, but naturally they are not business people. So we have a third pillar, which is public works, and the final pillar is coordination. So under that kind of an arrangement of the national employment uh, 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 strategy, we, we make a package which is accompanying the youth for their um, uh, empowerment. After the training, we request them to form groups like cooperatives. We provide toolkits for pillar two if they have a brilliant idea, innovative, brilliant idea, we provide support. We've put them countrywide in all uh, sectors of the country who help them to refine their strategy, their project proposal that becomes a bankable project proposal. And from there, there is the business development fund which government has established because quite often in African countries and Rwanda inclusive, Youngsters don't have corato security, and banks don't want to give them the, 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 the financial uh, facility. So under the, that fund, we, the, the business volume fund, we provide a 70% guarantee for those who have put themselves together so much that they become as well attractive to the financial institutions. And actually, when we started doing that, the financial institutions, you know, gave them the, the benefit of doubt to work with them. So I think that is a few things I, could, I would uh, like to share with you uh, in light of uh, rebranding technical vocational uh, education and some of the few innovative uh, uh, initiatives. And finally, I think we have thought of joint You know, you see, sometimes there is this tendency where universities look at themselves in silos, Ivory Tower is somewhere here, and TVET or Protechnics is somewhere here. But to us, 
under one government, one country, we made a joint arrangement. We have a very strong partnership with polytechnics and universities, and that's why yesterday I said that universities are making use of their workshops. But what universities have, they could also share. And in so doing, you know, we try to unlock some of the challenges which one of the subsectors could be having. Thank you. Thank you very much, and Honorable PS. It's, uh, I think it's uh, insightful also to share uh, some of the experiences, especially uh, as we talk about innovation and ICT, on how to actually make it uh, happen uh, and implement it in a practical manner. I would like to really thank you all for, the, for sharing the, the, those elements and those uh, uh, national experiences. And as I see, actually, there are many uh, similarities uh, in the different countries, as, for example, the importance of the institutional mechanisms and the synergies across uh, the different institutions. Uh, we also talked about the link with the industry, the ag agriculture, and also with the so societal priorities, and that, that has been, uh, been uh, manifested in really embedding TVET in national development plans, for example. Uh, we also talked about addressing the mismatch uh, and facilitating the school to work transition which is uh, a, an eternal uh, issue and some of the uh, solutions as you have highlighted is really to work closely with the private sector uh, to make sure that the, the, the key needs are identified and they can be adapted in the curriculum. Uh, we also talked about of course uh, the need for funding uh, which has uh, found many different uh, solutions and especially funds. A number of funds have been established in the different countries, and those are really there to support uh, the growth of TVET, and I think it's important to highlight it. Uh, but also, and I will end by that, uh, the contextualization is important. And what I hear from the different uh, countries' experiences is that depending on the context and the particular needs or the particular orientation of the country, uh, TVET has taken sometimes uh, uh, so somehow different formats and different images to, uh, to be adapted to the country. And this is exactly the discussions that we're having at a continental level when we talk about anything really, development. Development has to be contextualized and it's good to highlight it. Uh, right now I would like to open it to the floor for a couple of questions uh, to our ministers. Uh, again, I recalled and, and highlighted that uh, some of you or most of you have been in technical sessions and maybe some of the particular issues uh, have been highlighted and discussed there. Some that you would might to want to uh, probably share with uh, the, minister, the ministers and the representatives of ministries on the panel. Uh, I would like I will be taking just a few questions. Uh, please make sure to be very, very concise. And I would like to highlight that I would need questions. Uh, we can share the comments and inputs, uh, maybe uh, at a later stage. But if we have them on the platform and on the podium, it would be good to actually make use of uh, their knowledge and really ask questions. So I would like to give you the floor. We can start here. Thank you very much. My, my name is Hafsa Saif from Kenya. And I will go straight to the question. Uh, from all the presenters with the very insightful presentations, I did not hear anything about entrepreneurship. And that is very worrying in Tibet. Um, I really appreciate the, uh, the Rwanda training for employment and uh, the national employment strategy. It is a very uh, well thought out idea, very bright. When I come to Niger, they are also very, very well planned in their formal system. But as much as they're trying to direct the students, um, understand the different systems, uh, take the root of the general education, take the root of technical education, you are still thinking of how there is youth unemployment. You are still thinking how they can get a job. Why aren't we thinking of facilitating these students, these youth, in becoming self-employed and employing employing others. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I do recall that uh, Namibia minister had uh, talked about poverty eradication and entrepreneurship, but she can, uh, of course, elaborate a little bit more on that. I would like to 
come to this side. Uh, I will come back to this side as well, but I would like to come to this side. Thank you very much. Uh, this was indeed a very insightful presentation by the Honorable Ministers. I'm Raymond Nanda from Namibia. I would just like to ask the Permanent Secretary, um, with regard to the startup programs for the young graduates, uh, most, in most countries, these startups have the tendency to not to succeed once they have started. I just wanted to find out as to what is the success rate of startups in Rwanda and what mechanisms was put in place to ensure that these startups do not fail. Thank you. Thank you very much. We can move. Uh, you have a mic, yes, this time. Okay, merci. C'est Mireille qui sait le nom du Bénin. Je suis à la GIZ, conseiller technique. Ma question va au ministre du Niger. Vous avez d'abord parlé d'un fonds qui permet l'insertion des jeunes. Après, vous êtes allé à la qualité de l'enseignement professionnel. Et dans cette qualité, vous avez d'abord abordé l'équipement, puis la formation des formateurs et le curricula. Je voudrais savoir les stratégies que vous avez mis en place pour la mise en place de ces fonds-là. Parce qu'au Bénin, on est actuellement au niveau de la réforme de l'enseignement technique, mais on s'est rendu compte que le problème, c'est le problème de fonds. Alors au Niger, puisqu'on est des pays frais, qu'est-ce que vous, vous avez pu faire pour avoir ces fonds-là fonds qui sont mis à disposition Merci. Merci beaucoup. Can we go in the back? In, 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 the, in the back? Completely in the back? And, and of course, you will see that some people, we cannot take everyone but we'll try as much as possible. And I uh, have also... Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you very much, uh, honorable panelists. The question I want to ask is, we know the importance of TVET, and we know how TVET is so important to the development of African nation. But in our policies, Many, Tibet is still being relegated behind, and several um, policies laid down by our leaders are favoring the theoretical knowledge. So many of our youths are discouraged to take up Tibet courses. Many of them rather want to gain the university education, which is more theoretical. Please, how can you help us out with this challenge? My name is Sheung Popola from Yaba College of Technology, Lagos, Nigeria. Thank you. Uh, do you address your question to someone in particular? No, no. Okay. To any of them. Thank okay. you. Thank you very much. I would like to come back first so that we can maybe respond to some of the questions, or should we take a number of. Should we answer to the first questions? And then we can take the second round. Okay. Thank you. Um, I think I'll start with the, the last one. The, um, the participant from uh, Nigeria. I think when it comes to perceptions, negative perceptions about Tibet, it is a societal disease. And it starts in the family. It is therefore imperative for us in our respective countries who are drivers of TVET to ensure that we develop or establish a strategy of demystifying this negative perception. Um, generally, when a child or a student or a learner is about to reach the exit point of any um, education system. The engagement with parents is quite regular to say what next. And in most cases, particularly in Namibia, parents tend to leave their expectations and their failed dreams within their students by deciding for them as to what profession to follow. And this is something that really we need to do. In our country, for example, what we do, what we have done and we are doing, our TVET body, the body that is responsible for overseeing TVET under the ministry, which is Namibia Training Authority, 
we made it develop a program called Leave Your Passion. And in this program, they actually identify graduates of TVET who have made it in the industries, either working for some company or particularly those who are working for themselves. The gentleman, Dr. Nanda, who just stood up to ask a question here from Namibia, is one of those champions that are being used in that Live Your Passion educational video that is going around the country. He started off as a welder within TVET, moved on to become a principal of one of our TVET centers. But he moved on also to do his master's and PhD studies in the area of TVET. And eventually now, he's the deputy executive director within the Ministry of Higher Education overseeing the rolling out of the TVET system in the country. So really, I think we need to do more when it comes to demystifying uh, or rather addressing the myth that TVET is for failures. The other thing uh, that I can move on to is this thing of the entrepreneurship. I think within TVET, we must have one common reality. And the reality is that if we are to address our national human resource development as countries within Africa, we've got to integrate TVET, or rather, we've got to integrate entrepreneurship in TVET training. Mm -hmm. There is no way we can uh, really divorce the two. TVET must be seen as a vehicle that leads to employment creation, that leads to uh, financial independence of our youth, that leads to new enterprises within a given country, and obviously economic growth. Mm -hmm. So I think you are right. Entrepreneurship is the base, the foundation of TVET. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think there was also another question on the startups. Uh, et puis une autre question sur le, le, le fond et la, les, les stratégies de mise en place de ce fonds. So maybe we can start with Rhonda, and then uh, Niger will, will um, take up the question. Thank you very much. Uh, a question from with it. A question from Namibia about the success rate of the startups. Uh, I think under the National Employment Program. We learned along the way. One thing we observed, observed, sorry, was for individual startups, whatever we did, the success rate was too small, around 10%. Then we had to rechange our strategy. We said, look, we want to work with you under the National Employment Program that form at least groups, form cooperatives, and actually, we linked skills development to entrepreneurship. That's what I mentioned about the entrepreneurship and business development. Whether one person has the idea, get a group of a minimum of 10, closely work together, that we could closely follow up. And by the way, the institutional arrangement to follow up this is right from the grassroots and local authority level. And of course, the success rate there with the new approach is far much higher than how it used to be at around 10% initially when we used to work with specific individuals. So we, the strategy was five years, but we kept on changing as we meet challenges along the way. And remember, we provide a guarantee. So we have a very, very close follow-up that we don't want to lose the guarantee we provided. Our intention is not for the business to fail. We want them to succeed because if it fails, the 70% which I mentioned about is taken. And definitely that would uh, deplete the fund. You know, so there is a very close follow-up from the uh, National Employment Secretariat and the concerned different institutions to ensure that the success level is quite higher. So we had to rechange. And uh, at sectoral level, we have people we call those uh, business advisory services. So at every other level, we don't only follow up the success of your business at only project design or acquisition of resources. We do accompaniment to know what is the challenge and so on and so forth. So there is that accompaniment because initially in the first three years, we had very serious challenges of, you know, uh, 
most of those companies never survived the valley of death, you know, uh, and a big proportion were not surviving the first, uh, they would fail before celebrating the first anniversary. So we said, no, this is not sustainable and we're also losing. So we kept on changing along the way. And finally, my sister from Kenya, here the experience is that for secondary, for TVET, even university, entrepreneurship is part of the package. So at every other level, we have included entrepreneurship in the curriculum. But exclusively for TVET in the short term courses, I talked about the package. It is skills development, entrepreneurship, business development. Actually, there are phases. From the skills development, you go to phase two, four, entrepreneurship, business development, accompanied. From there, go financial institutions and so on so forth. So it's continuous and it is jointly followed up with the different government institutions closely working with the private sector. Thank you. Thank you very much. Excellence. Merci, madame. Je voudrais répondre à une préoccupation soulevée par la madame du Kenya qui a dit que nous avons un peu décrit le dispositif que nous avons, mais nous n'avons pas parlé de l'auto-emploi. Je l'ai dit, en fait, nous sommes convaincus que dans tous les cas, les perspectives d'emploi ne peuvent être que dans le secteur privé. Car lorsque nous parlons du secteur privé, nous voyons un, l'auto-emploi, c'est-à-dire que des jeunes puissent initier par eux-mêmes, individuellement ou collectivement, leurs entreprises, ou bien de simplement qu'ils trouvent un emploi salarié dans une entreprise qui existe. Au Niger, nous avons créé un ministère exclusivement dédié à l'entrepreneuriat des jeunes. Il existe dans notre gouvernement un ministre chargé de l'entrepreneuriat des jeunes. C'est un ministère qui a été créé justement pour prendre en charge cette problématique effectivement d'accompagnement des jeunes. Parce que nous sommes convaincus qu'ils ont besoin de soutien, ils ont besoin d'accompagnement, ils ont besoin de formation et donc le ministère là s'occupe exclusivement de cette question justement euh, de l'auto-emploi et de l'accompagnement. J'ai parlé également du fonds d'appui à la formation professionnelle et technique. Et ce fonds, euh, il fait des formations de courte durée à l'intention des non-scolarisés et des déscolarisés. Et à la fin de leur cycle de formation, il les accompagne avec des équipements. Euh, il leur octroie euh, certain, un certain petit capital de départ, effectivement, pour les accompagner, pour qu'ils euh, montrent leur propre entreprise ou bien qu'ils s'associent et en groupe, effectivement, pour euh, commencer leurs activités. Donc, la dimension euh, auto-emploi, elle est au cœur de la problématique. Il n'y a pas d'autre perspective que, que, que cela. Il faut les encourager, il faut euh, les inciter à aller. Et il y a même un aspect particulier en ce qui concerne les filles et les femmes, parce que c'est une, aussi une autre dimension importante. Euh, Malheureusement, dans l'enseignement technique, vous avez, on a très peu de femmes. Et aujourd'hui, nous avons un volet autonomisation des filles et des femmes. Parce que nous sommes convaincus qu'on ne pourra pas sortir de l'engrenage dans lequel nous sommes si, justement, les filles et les femmes continuent à être laissées de côté. Donc, il y a aussi un accompagnement dans ce sens pour vous dire que c'est quelque chose qui est vraiment au cœur de la stratégie et de la politique donc, du gouvernement. Et... Nous faisons un focus particulier sur les nouvelles technologies de l'information et de la communication, puisqu'il y a une agence qui, elle, dédiée aux jeunes sur les intiques, ce que nous appelons le SIPMEN. Je crois qu'ici, je ne sais pas si elle est là, nous avons une jeune nigérienne, euh, en tout cas qui est sur cette question-là, et qui est là, qui est venue au forum des jeunes, elle s'appelle Falila, elle était là. Euh, donc pour vous dire que euh, la dimension auto-emploi vraiment est totalement prise en compte. Je voudrais répondre à ma soeur du Bénin qui posait la question de savoir, euh, on a parlé du, du FAPA, euh, comment est-ce que justement on arrive à l'alimenter Alors le FAPA c'est un fonds d'appui à l'apprentissage et à la formation professionnelle euh, qui est approvisionné de diverses manières. Et nous avons déjà au Niger créé ce que nous appelons la taxe d'apprentissage qui est versée par les entreprises. Donc c'est ce fonds, donc l'État recouvre et il reverse une partie justement de cette taxe d'apprentissage à, à ce fonds. Ensuite, l'État octroie une subvention annuelle à ce fonds-là. Et en dehors de ça, depuis quelques années maintenant, dans le cadre du partenariat que nous avons avec certaines institutions, certains organes et même certains pays, 
Et il y a des conventions qui sont signées de manière directe avec ce fonds, où les ressources sont mises à la disposition de ce fonds-là pour former et pour accompagner justement les jeunes. Donc il y a pour l'essentiel trois sources de financement dont dispose aujourd'hui ce fonds-là. Et je rappelle à la dame du Bénin que nous sommes dans le cadre de, de l'UMOA, dans ce que nous appelons le cadre permanent, du cadre de concertation. Et nous partageons régulièrement au sein des pays membres, dont le Bénin. D'ailleurs, le Bénin assure le secrétariat exécutif de ce, de ce cadre de concertation de, de promotion de l'FPT dans l'espace UMOA. Et d'ailleurs, nous allons nous retrouver le 27 prochain au Bénin, à Cotonou, pour discuter justement euh, des de, 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 de politiques que nous mettons en œuvre et du partage d'expériences euh, dans notre espace UMOA. Merci. Merci beaucoup, je pense que c'est très clair. Euh, et bien sûr, vous avez l'opportunité d'avoir peut-être plus de discussions sur les défis particuliers de la, de, de la région. On va... Sorry. We are going to take two last questions before we close the session. Oh, oh yes. And before we do that, uh, I would like to give you the floor to... Yeah, uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Moderator. Uh, I'll start with the issue of entrepreneurship. In Tanzania, entrepreneurship, we consider it as a cross-cutting skill. So it doesn't matter what level of education you are in. Entrepreneurship is embedded in the curriculum from primary, secondary, but it's given more weight when you go into uh, TVT and higher learning institutions. And I'm pleased to say that uh, our universities and polytechnic uh, colleges have even uh, gone further to establish incubation centers. So that once uh, students show entrepreneurship skills, then they are, not uh, they are not allowed to go without developing further their ideas, their innovation, uh, and the target is to develop into uh, a business package. And we have this and it's working well. But also we have the Commission for Science and Technology, which is responsible for identifying and, de and the developing innovators in the country. And we have funds, which is SETI. And I think somehow it's like we are still doing the previous model that Rwanda was doing. We are supporting individual startups as well as group, uh, I mean, company startups. And I'm pleased to inform the delegates that uh, through this support of who, uh, people with the innovation, innovative ideas, uh, we have even we have even created billionaires in the country. We have young uh, Tanzanians who were, had some idea developing ICT programs in Max Malipo, and their software was was adopted by the, the the government, the private sectors, and they are making a lot of money. So I think that is an example of who a very successful story, but we have a lot of other successful stories. For example, University of uh, Sokoine University of Agriculture, they also uh, give skills in entrepreneurship so that they don't only learn about the agricultural skills, but uh, for us, we say agriculture uh, is the key to the national development. And if students who are graduating from agricultural uh, university, they go to the village, they go to their community, and they cannot do anything, so it will not portray the emphasis that the government is saying agriculture is the key. So we really uh, emphasize that our students, they also learn skills on how to add value in the products that they, they produce and so on. So because of time, I will not go further, but we really take seriously the issue of entrepreneurship in our education system. And also, uh, I think one, my, my sister from Nigeria uh, has spoken about the issue of policy that sometimes uh, the policies within the countries are not giving a due consideration as far as the Tibet is concerned. I will say that uh, things are changing. We all know that with the colonial education, emphasis was on the uh, caller jobs. We all know where we came from. And I think that's what perpetuated the, uh, whatever the law status that is accorded to TVT training. But now things are changing. Where are those uh, white collar jobs? Uh, most of people, graduates, who, uh, they either have to uh, 
start their own companies or have to work with the private sector because private sector now is becoming the main uh, employer. And we know with private sector, you really have to have uh, skills, hands-on experience. So things are changing. And I can say, for example, in our, our experience from TVT graduates, some of them are getting employment even before they graduate. When they go for practical training, some companies uh, would like to, uh, to take them because they're highly skilled. And of course, we tell our graduates, be patient, finish your, your program so that at the end of the day, when you are employed, then you are, I mean, you have already finished your, your training. So even we, we have national qualification framework which articulates the linkages between academic training and vocational training. And uh, I'm proud to say with this, uh, uh, in this conference, where most people come from Tibet area, that uh, during the agricultural, national agricultural competition, Tibet institutions emerged the top in the country because uh, part of the Tibet is to uh, provide a solution to real life situations. And our country, Tanzania, 80% of uh, citizens are farmers. So in the Tibet training, our training is contextualized. We, we focus on uh, what, is, what skills uh, is required in, in, in what area or in which area. So for example, the students in Tibet are creating solutions to farmers maybe uh, simple machines for, for planting, harvesting, and so on. And I'm very proud to say that we are doing very well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for sharing. Um, so I will take two last questions. <laughs> the lady in red and the gentleman here. Thank you very much, I'm I ten, 10 seconds though. Yeah, my question, my name is uh, Dr. And Mrs. Basile Bokwe from Federal Polytechnic, Naked Oweri State, Nigeria. Now I want to ask, the last speaker talks about rebranding. And um, when we talk about TVET, I know TVET has to do with flexibility, adaptability. You can't really talk about TVET like in Nigeria. The MBTA with the Federal Ministry of Education, you know, in trying to rebrand TVET, had so many programs, started with FDA, FSD, from there, open distance, flexible learning. And right now we're talking about TIA, tertiary institution e-learning resource. Now, these are the things we are putting in place to ensure real rebranding in TVET. I don't know about your country, what you are doing because you didn't tell us about the flexibility of the rebranding you are talking about. Thank, Thank you. you. We come here for the last question. Thank you. And my name is Professor Gabriel Katana from Kenya. To all the panelists, uh, my question. You will uh, have to select one in the interest of time. OK. Whoever will respond will be the one. Uh, um, my question deals with inclusivity. In all the intervention programs that are going on, I wanted to see the space, or I did not hear the space, about the youth and the people who are living with disability. What programs do we have that would be including them? Particularly, I'd be curious to know among the 60 youth that we have in Rwanda, the special brains or those sharp brains, how many of those would have been detected or identified from the ones living with disability? Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, apologies for those who have not been able to ask questions. I also know that in all sessions, some people always have the hand up. So unfortunately, I had to discriminate against you so that we are able to hear uh, different people as well. But this is definitely not uh, intentional. We are hoping to really have the conversation continue, but also be mindful of time, as uh, it, is, it has been a scarce resource. Uh, so I would like to give uh, the panel um, a last uh, word, maybe a last two minutes, to one, address some of the questions, and also for your concluding remarks. Thank you. Uh, 
I'll start with my sister again from Nigeria. I'm not sure whether I got her question correctly, but she said that I have not provided experience on how Tanzania is doing in terms of rebranding TVT. And I think what I was explaining is all about the issue of rebranding. I talked about the establishment of uh, sector skills councils, where we work with the uh, private sector to identify areas and skills which are, are needed. And the idea is that once we hear from them, we design tailor-made or contextualized programs to meet that. And also the issue of fourth industrial revolution, in our TV we have introduced the uh, causes such as 3D printing, we have introduced mechatronics. So because of interest of time, maybe you can even continue conversation outside this, but yes, I, I, I said uh, we are doing rebranding to meet the demand, and our causes are not uniform across the country. We have TVETs which are specialized in, in uh, for example, ICT, some in fisheries, some in agriculture, and of course there are common skills like welding, carpentry, uh, tailoring, which are provided almost all over because they are needed. So we are conscious of that and we, are, we keep on revising our curriculum as, uh, as needed. So Madam, in conclusion, I would like to thank all the uh, delegates for their interest in our, in our panel and for their comments. I'm sure if we had time, we could have more, but it has been uh, very uh, interesting, and I appreciate the organizer for organizing this session for us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Honorable Minister. Thank you. Um, as far as rebranding is concerned in Namibia, I think the main thrust in terms of our focus for rebranding is the TVET curriculum. It's fundamental for us. It has to be systematic. It has to be well articulated. It has to be well benchmarked. Number two, what is important in this rebranding is the instructor's education. We know that there are many of our trainers who only have certificate or diploma in their respective traits, but they are not properly trained to be able to impart the knowledge they have. So pedagogical skills in TVET, we consider that to be critical. Thirdly, in rebranding, we are saying our TVET must help the government of Namibia to answer some specific strategic policies. Like I said, rural urban migration, poverty eradication, social imbalances, you know, growth, uh, economic growth and many others. And I believe as time goes on, indeed we'll be able to see dividends uh, within the TVET system. Um, to conclude, I would like to say as Africa, it is important that we continuously get together in fora such as this to really begin to have fertilization of ideas on specific uh, important areas that put all our countries on the pedestal so that we can succeed together, so that Africa and the AU could actually talk about the Africa we want. Thank you. Thank you very much. Excellence. Oui. Merci, madame. Je voudrais juste réagir par rapport à la question du professeur qui parlait de, des handicapés. C'est bien cela, je crois. Hein? Lorsque on parle de la prise en compte de, de l'ensemble des jeunes, Il s'agit de prendre toutes les catégories. Nous avons, au niveau du, en ce qui concerne le Niger, même au niveau du ministère, une direction qui a en charge spécifiquement cela, qu'on appelle la direction en charge de groupes spécifiques. Les groupes spécifiques, c'est les femmes, c'est les, les handicaps, et, tout, tout, et selon tous les handicaps. Et ça, c'est pris en compte déjà dans l'élaboration des différents programmes. Et il y a des programmes qui sont exclusivement dédiés à cette catégorie, justement, des jeunes. Donc, L'objectif, c'est vraiment de n'oublier personne. C'est de n'oublier personne, quel que soit le handicap et quel que soit, euh, bien évidemment, euh, son incapacité euh, sociale. Donc, euh, c'est pris en compte. Je voudrais rassurer le professeur par rapport euh, à, à cette dimension-là. Je voudrais, puisqu'il s'agit de la dernière fois où je prends la parole, également remercier en tout cas tous les participants et remercier les autorités rwandaises et les organisateurs de la CAPA qui ont bien voulu nous convier à ce forum-là. Merci encore une fois. Merci à vous aussi. 
Thank you, uh, Madam Moderator. Uh, to the question from my brother from Kenya, uh, he, was, he talked about the inclusivity of people with disability in the selection process of uh, the students within the Coding Academy. I think for a start, because this is our year one, our only one criteria was academic excellence. And we don't think that it should be only limited to academic excellence because we even deliberated and realized that uh, talent identification might not necessarily be limited to academic excellence. And some of those other criteria definitely will be brought on course. And in light of inclusivity, I think inclusivity is a critical component because in our nine point strategy for the education, entire education sector, among the nine we have exclusively a strategy on inclusive education for all across, across all the three subsectors of the education sector. So with, in the light of these 60, definitely that wasn't a criteria, but you never, I, I'm not certain I think uh, VC Keshemba could be aware, but they were not discriminated on that. Some of them who could be having disability and meet the academic excellence, they were welcome. So, and uh, I think that's what I would say uh, briefly in light of that. To my sister in, from Kenya about uh, the branding, I think we try to link the classic way of doing things uh, in technical vocational training to how different should we also be doing it. And finally, one of the other points, I think I had mentioned about it yesterday, was the coordination of it. Uh, because when you talk about TVET, most people think of that is an issue of the Ministry of Education and Education Institutions. But the way we look at TVET here, it's a multi-sectoral component, and its coordination driving it should not be looked, into on, looked at in only in the lenses of education, but look holistically in the entire economy. What do you want from each of those different key players? And I think it has been so in instrumental to us. And uh, actually, during the course of strat strategy development for TVET, these different sectors have played a key role. And actually, they have been very, very informative when they are not necessarily from education, sector or high learning institution, neither TV institution. So we highly appreciated that very strong partnership and engagement of those different institutions. For example, here we have eight different ministries. We don't have so many ministries. When you talk about eight ministries here, I think these are eight out of around 16 ministries who are part of it. And we brought on board 14 other institutions which are not linked directly to uh, the Ministry of Education. So that sectoral arrangement and prioritization of technical vocational. To us, it has been a top priority, even in terms of funding. Initially, prior to the last 10 years, it wasn't, that wasn't the case. But today, uh, it's been a darling baby, honestly, and, and they know it. You know, when you look at the state of art infrastructure facility, they have it. Others actually envy what has been happening in Tibet, but we thought, it is a key component if we, we are to do industrial development and, and uh, a cornerstone and a strong foundation for industrial development within our country. And that's why that special attention was given to, to TVET. Finally, I would like to take this opportunity to thank all participants coming, being an official from the Ministry of Education. We thank you very much for this initiative and thank you for choosing Rwanda to host this meeting. Thank you. God bless. Thank you very much. I would like to really ask you to help me congratulate the dear panelists, the honorable ministers that have taken their time to share the insights, to share um, their journey, the journey of their countries. So allow me to ask you to please help them, uh, help me congratulate them, sorry. And I would also like to uh, welcome, uh, before the panelists leave the podium, welcome the Secretary General of uh, CAPA as well as the, the Vice Chair of the Board, um, um, 
Professor Laila to please come forth for a quick word of appreciation before we officially break for lunch. Thank you. Thank you very much, moderator, honorable ministers, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. Um, I am honored to be given the privilege to invite the distinguished deputy chairperson of the executive board of CAPA to appreciate our honorable ministers for finding time to travel um, and to answer to the invite that was sent for them to attend this very important 41st anniversary international conference of CAPA. Thank you very much for a splendid platform that you have put up, sharing your experiences um, that happens in your various economies and for the rest of Africa to learn. Thank you very much. And I now invite the deputy chair of the Executive Board of CAPA. Thank you. Yeah. We're starting with uh, Professor Joyce Dalicho, uh, Honorable Minister of Education, Science, and Technology from Tanzania. Next, I think it's uh, Dr. Ita Kanjili Morangi, Honorable Minister of Education, Training, and Innovation from Namibia. Honorable Tijani Idrissa Abdul Kadir, Minister for Education, Niger. <laughs> He's wondering why I'm not hugging him. <laughs> Next, Mr. Samuel Mulindo, Permanent Secretary, Ministry of Education, Rwanda, on behalf of uh, Rosemary. Thank you very much, Kappa Secretary, and thank you again to the panelists that I have shared with you during this session. And uh, again, thanks to all who have uh, contributed and all that were willing to contribute. Enjoy your lunch, and uh, see you in the afternoon. Bon appétit. <laughs>